Well, we can get started with our introduction as people drop into the room. Will we do that in the interest of time? So my name is Olive Kokeman and I work with the Network for Improving Quality of Care for Maternal Newborn and Child Health. And so welcome to you all today to this networking hour at Align MNH. So we are networking with the network um, and we are really keen to hear your comments and your reflections and questions of the session that we just um, had, which was um, about learning from implementation, the national forums on improving quality of care for maternal mm -hmm. and child health. Okay. So, I'm going to not. So, so this networking session is aligned to that presentation. Um, could you go on mute, colleagues, if you um, are not speaking at the moment? So essentially, um, we really are excited to have you here with us, to hear your comments and reflections um, on progress so far with the activities of the network, pose questions that came to mind during the presentations earlier, we apologize. The session got very disjointed due to some technological issues. We hope you could um, take away some key findings, particularly the progress report findings. And, and we heard from, from two of the countries in the network, some strong presentations from Nigeria and Ghana. And so for those of you who, who just need a little recap, over the past four years, a group of countries, namely Bangladesh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ethiopia, Ghana, India, Malawi, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Uganda and Tanzania, with partners, established the network for improving quality of care for maternal, newborn, and child health. There was the ambitious goal to have maternal, newborn deaths and stillbirths, and to improve the experience of care for pregnant women, mothers, and their babies. So during that time, since 2017, lessons have emerged on how to progress towards these goals by building and institutionalizing systems to be able to implement quality of care across programs and countries. You heard presentations from our Ministry of Health colleagues from Ghana, Health Services, Dr. Isabella and Dr. Sama from the Federal Ministry of Health Nigeria on their implementation progress, challenges and recommendations, lessons they have been learning over the past number of years. You heard from our UNICEF colleague from, um, from TEDBAB um, and also from Anshu presenting the progress report of progress that has been documented across um, those past four years um, for the network countries and the evolution of the network um, as a multicultural, multi-country, multi <laughs> multilateral network focused on maternal newborn and child health quality um, of care as an integrated health system effort. And the progress report also documents the role the network has worked to play to catalyze the development of national policies and strategies and structures and the working countries to document interrogate progress. So on May 4th, um, we will launch the progress report. Today was um, the first opportunity to share findings um, to try to highlight some of those critical levers that countries interested in implementing quality of care at scale need to consider. So we welcome you on May 4th. But today we really would like to hear all comments, all reflections and questions. This is an open forum, everybody um, can speak. We have a few small housekeeping um, items. You can choose to type your questions in the chat box and, and Blurta and I will act as moderators and, and call upon um, you to speak to those questions. Um, you can raise your hand if you want to just speak. Um, again, we will just call upon you. And we ask you to keep your spoken comments just concise um, so that others have time to make their comments. We have um, established a, just a, a vague structure. You know, firstly, we'd like to hear the comments and reflections of the content today. More broadly, if colleagues would like to hear about, oops, I've just move my slide too far. If colleagues would like to get more into developing and implementing the structures um, to support scaling up of maternal newborn and child health um, with quality. Um, we also have colleagues that could like share more, shed more light on work on data and measurement for quality improvement. And finally, we can get to that moment of, you know, how to get engaged with the network and, um, and stay engaged in this process as we continue to move forward. Um, we have an esteemed panel here, um, colleagues that were presenting with us um, in the session earlier. Um, we have Anshu and Ted Bab who, who know, need no introduction. Um, but we have Rosalind Doe from the Zorijo Country Office Ghana, um, who can share a rich experience from the Ghana experience. Um, we have Martin and Moise and Matthew from WHO headquarters, um, 
Martin and, and Moise working very much on country implementation and data respectively for the network secretariat and Matthew uh, working on quality of care as an integrated health system department. Um, and finally, we have from the Nigeria country office, Huia. we have Nuhu from Afro regional office and we have Priscilla for UNICEF Ghana and they can share rich experience from the country and, and um, regional perspective. So we're ready for your questions. Just we underlined the first name just to help you to direct your question if you need. Um, this is a, you know, a, a big bunch of, of people. Um, so Blerta, do we have a first question? Yes, we do. And I think it would be good to start with, uh, with Shams and Matthews. It is a follow up of questions that were not answered during the previous session. Uh, Shams Matthews, there is an interest from participants to understand what is the role of national policies and strategies and why should countries establish quality of care structures? Uh, could you please comment, make a comment on that? And uh, if you can shed some light on how we are, we as maternal and newborn health community are building some of the uh, content as well as what role we're playing as a pathfinder in this implementation. Thank you. And please drop your questions in the chat. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question, Blurter. Um, greeting colleagues, uh, just a couple of thoughts on that one. I think one of the things that we should emphasize that when the quality, equity, and dignity network was um, established, and when we when when it was being designed, co-developed with the countries, there was a real opportunity to think through how national strategic direction on quality of care for MNCH could be um, tallied and be um, aligned with overall national strategic direction on quality health services for the population as a whole. Um, and really that provided us with an opportunity to learn from the countries rather than us imposing some of our thinking uh, on countries. Um, and just to remind ourselves that um, the work of the WHO on national quality policy and strategy was actually formed by a number of the QED network countries. And, and what that taught us, and this is the countries teaching us as opposed to the other way around, is that there is a really important role for pathfinder approaches for quality of care for specific population groups, huge and important population groups in this case, to then take the national strategic direction on quality to another level. And this is where the linkages with overall health policy and planning comes together. And this is also where the linkages with service packages for universal health coverage and health performance assessments come into play as well. Before turning to uh, Matthew for some additional points, I think it's worthwhile emphasizing uh, particular examples of that within the network countries. So particularly to emphasize the role that, for example, a country like Ethiopia has had in making that uh, balance between quality of care for a specific population group, but also as part of the health sector transformation plan, ensuring that quality is placed as a core pillar within a health sector transformation plan. So just a few thoughts there, Blurter, we can go into some more, the, more of the details, but I would welcome some additional thoughts from Matthew. Yeah, just a, a couple of points of, of emphasis. Thanks, uh, Shams. I think what we've seen in terms of lessons learned from quality initiatives around the world is the need for what's happening at the point of care to be supported by that broader system. And so that national strategic direction is one part in creating that broader system that can then support sustainability and scale up. Second point of emphasis is just on what what we mean when we talk about that pathfinder uh, approach, what we're really saying is that the work on maternal and child health can help to drive those system-wide efforts. And of course, that's been an explicit priority of the, the network uh, countries and something they've been really trying to, to take forward. So it helps to promote that full alignment of the MNCH programme alongside the broader quality programme, ensuring efficiency uh, of quality efforts 
efforts and leveraging that political support and financial resource uh, to be able to make the maximum mm -hmm. impact. It also then it helps to facilitate that joint operational planning, the engagement of technical partners, as well as building that learning system to enable sharing and scale up of emerging best practice from the network uh, and from MNCH quality out to the broader health system. So certainly very pleased to see the, the lessons that have come out of the network in terms of using national quality direction uh, as a, a method of supporting uh, what happens at the point of care. Thank you very much, uh, Shams. Thank you very much, Matthew. As you are both uh, continuing, so allow me to continue on the same part in terms of the health system strengthening and its impact to quality of care. There is a question from Kate Ramsey in the chat, and she's interested to know how can health systems provider, uh, pro uh, provide a better support to strengthen the workforce management so that the workforce can improve its performance. So, and if you have any examples. And with that examples, I'd like to ask my other colleagues who are working in Ghana and Nigeria, if they can reflect after you on the concrete examples on quality improvement and building quality improvement skills for the workforce if possible. So over to you, Shams and Matthew. I don't know whom among you would like to take this question first. Yeah, just, just a few um, initial thoughts there, Blurt. It's a great question from Kate. Um, this is exactly why that systems approach to quality becomes so important. So understanding, and I would be very keen to hear from our country level colleagues on this one, but understanding the actual numbers associated with providing care is important. But of course, the actual skill sets and capacities um, is, is fundamental. One of the reasons why the national strategic direction setting is so important is that we, do emphasize within that frame of reference different types of interventions. And we, we categorize those so that it can be organized around systems environment, can be organized around reducing harm, clinical improvement, and patient, family, and community engagement. And this is where those different interventions can be mutually supportive. And within the system's environment interventions, the role of specific um, interventions related to health workers, the classic supportive supervision mechanisms, but going beyond that into roles related to sharing and learning become fundamentally important, and particularly in learning districts. And this is where I would want to come to my final point is ensuring that we have health worker consideration, not just at the facility level, but how we organize services at the district level and at the subnational level that allows us to organize for quality. Of course, these are really complex issues, but the fact that they get on the agenda becomes important. Uh, Matthew may want to add. Yeah, just, just one point of emphasis there is that in all the work on planning for quality at national uh, district and facility level, we emphasize health workers a, as a community themselves that need to be engaged. So many of the, the answers to how to provide that better support through the strategic uh, effort uh, can be found in engaging intentionally the health workers. Uh, and when we say health workers, of course, not just those involved directly in clinical care, but also the porters, the cleaners, those other health uh, workers that, of course, are so important in that delivery of quality care at the point of care. So engagement is a key aspect here. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Thank you, Shams. I know we have colleagues from uh, country offices, UNICEF and WHO in Ghana and Nigeria. So uh, would, would any of you like to comment a bit more on the skill development and building uh, of health workers on quality improvement and how this is being addressed now, especially at the front lines in some of the learning districts where you are uh, following the implementation very closely through monitoring and research. Um, and I don't know if you can raise your hands, but I'll just ask so if Rosaline, or Muyo or Priscilla would like to comment on that. Uh, 
Not sure that some colleagues have been able to join. Uh, well, if not, then I'll make a comment on that, uh, at least from the um, from the uh, the three the two countries that we heard before the, the presentations, Nigeria and Ghana. Both countries are working a lot in terms of building capacities of frontline health workers and district managers, so looking at that intermediary management level for them to be able to address quality of care holistically. So that is from both sides, from those who are providing the clinical care to be able to provide uh, good care by following not only the guidelines, but by being able to adapt the implementation to their own context and for that adaptation, they do require quality improvement skills. So a lot is going in ter on in terms of trying to build uh, that type of competency uh, that is required in the intermediary management level, but also at the frontline level. Uh, it's obvious from the developments in all the network countries that you need more than only uh, project-specific investments. You do need a system behind to build those capacities and competencies and to maintain them in the longer term. Therefore, having a, a systemic approach to quality of care and quality improvement that allows for teams and individuals to apply their quality improvement skills, but at the same time does support a quality of care culture uh, are two elements that are fundamental if we want to see uh, changes at scale, but also sustained improvements uh, when it comes in, uh, in terms of maternal and newborn health. Uh, in our community, this is even more important. We have defined quality not only as provision of care, but as perception, so how people are receiving that care. Therefore, a respectful care cannot be uh, provided if you don't address continuously any gaps in the way on how services are delivered. Um, and I'll stop here. I don't know if any of the panelists would like to address this question. If not, I'd like to shift to another one. Uh, and that is um, more about in relation to measurement and data. And I'd like to ask the help of my colleague, uh, Moise Muzigaba, who is uh, leading the work on quality of care for maternal and newborn health measurement. Uh, so Moise, there were a number of questions that came up during the previous session on measurement of quality. So one among them was that, uh, how do we ensure to have ready available quality data to support the implementation of a quality of care network? So basically, a uh, framework, pardon. So uh, basically, is, uh, what, how do we uh, look at the quality of, the, of care data? And then the, the subsequent question was, uh, what are some of the major challenges in getting quality of care data from the routine information systems. Moise, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Blerta. Uh, so maybe to highlight that the approach for quality of care measurement at country level is pretty similar to what you would do for a quality of care programming in general. Um, it follows a systems approach um, in that there are different um, issues that need to be addressed at different levels of the health system to be able to sustain or in fact start the quality of care measurement um, agenda at country level. Um, but maybe starting with the quality of care measurement framework that has been proposed by WHO, it does propose um, four measurement components that holistically um, would be required to be able to respond to quality of care measurement needs at country level. And in there, obviously, there is a set of indicators that have been proposed. Um, the first version of the indicators is what is referred to as the core indicator. So these are the typical indicators that can be collected routinely um, <clears throat> from health facilities and shared with partners for different purposes, um, including tracking where the quality is happening as it, it is being delivered, and also to assess progress in general around clinical outcomes and impact. And then there's another set of indicators um, that are referred to as uh, quality improvement indicators. And these are typical indicators that are uh, to be used to support improvement work, ongoing improvement work, primarily at uh, proximal level. So at the point of care, at the health facility, and to a certain degree to aid the district level managers to understand what the challenges are in terms of uh, quality improvement 
at the health facility level. And there's another set of uh, metrics that are referred to as the implementation milestones. Um, these are mostly uh, programmatic metrics that uh, are usually country specific and therefore not so much prescriptive. So arguably the quality of care measurement um, agenda is relatively new to many countries and there, there's a need to have disruptive uh, uh, processes to ensure that it is done at country level. Um, and it is as such important to for countries to understand the extent to which they are able to uh, operationalize the quality of care measurement framework that has been um, uh, proposed. Because um, as we have noted in the network, there are some indicators that are not necessarily um, available in most countries' health information systems. And therefore, their measurement and reporting becomes quite difficult if countries do not understand that in fact, there is that gap that exists. So the initial phase before you um, uh, roll out the entire agenda at country level is to understand where are we vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the monitoring framework that has been proposed and the indicators that are in there. So once countries understand where they are, then it, it would be important to start um, where they are essentially. So for example, at national level, if there's been some kind of agreement, uh, if there hasn't been an agreement as to what the uh, minimum set of quality of care indicators for monitoring across all levels um, should be, uh, there would be a need to, to, to look into that first. And then it goes without saying that the adaptation of the uh, district and facility data collection tools uh, to respond to the measurement needs is also important. Um, and that goes well with the um, what I like to call the health information system reform um, to ensure that the indicator uh, data elements that are required for monitoring are actually embedded within the national health information system so that health facilities are able to collect this information and report it upwards uh, to levels above the health facility itself. Um, it, it, information that's not co that's collected and not used is, is very much away. So there's a need to establish a transparent reporting system for health facilities and district um, and national levels. Uh, to ensure that as information is reported is actually used by um, the, the relevant users. Um, and this can be in the form of uh, dashboards, uh, real-time dashboards, and most importantly, to ensure that there's a, a data quality verification mechanism that is in place. It goes without saying that this system should not be different from what already exists for other indicators. There are other programmatic indicators that exist in the system already. So that could be done in one go. Um, and given the fact that the indicators, the quality of care indicators are relatively new to most countries in terms of how they are defined, how they are supposed to be calculated, there is a need for capacity building at different levels um, of the health system to ensure that the users of these indicators understand how they're supposed to be used, how they're supposed to be collected, and for what purpose, because quality of care measurement does focus on measurement for improvement, is there is measurement for accreditation, there's measurement for general tracking of progress. So all these issues need to be accounted for. And then moving away from the national level efforts to support the quality of care measurement agenda, which I would say that's the main macro level infrastructure that allows uh, much lower levels uh, of, of quality of care activities to happen. Um, there's a need to also uh, uh, ensure that at regional level, there are activities that support district level and facility level activities in terms of quality of care measurement. It is important to know where you start. So the regional level uh, um, uh, managers or district level managers would need to ideally um, um, help health facilities assess where they are. Um, so for, at the outset, where are you in terms of quality of care and what should be the priorities for a specific period of time? So through the baseline measurement, you're able to know um, where the pain points are and what needs to be addressed. And therefore that becomes the priority for measurement uh, moving forward as well. Uh, they would have to support um, the health facilities um, in various aspects, including uh, to ensure that there is enough personnel, for example, at the health facility for collecting this information and also the standardization of forms to ensure that um, uh, there's a platform that uh, would allow the collection and reporting of the quality of care indicators. 
At health facility level, which is pretty much where the point of care quality improvement happens, um, quality of care measurement may take two forms. So one is quality of care uh, measurement for reporting on progress of Sentinel indicators that are collected across different health facilities, uh, but is also quality of care measurement for QI purposes. So as health facilities select um, or <clears throat> um, embark on quality improvement initiatives to, to improve specific areas of care, they will select uh, or choose a quality of care indicators that are aligned with the improvement goals. Um, that may vary from one health facility to another. So the measurement there is not very prescriptive as opposed to the Sentinel type of indicators that are supposed to be measured across the board. Um, and that requires also a, a tools, it requires support, it requires the establishment of the quality improvement teams um, within which a measurement person ideally should serve the purpose of ensuring that um, data is being collected to inform whether there's a need to make some improve, uh, to make changes in how they are implementing their quality improvement efforts and so on and so forth. For the major part, which is the cross um, facility reporting of quality of care, it goes without saying that the available registers or uh, health, health informatics tools in that health facility need to accommodate those indicators. And I did say the, the, the indicators that we have, the, the Sentinel indicators that we have proposed for quality of care measurement are relatively new in terms of how they are defined and the data elements that are required to build them. So um, efforts should be made, and I guess this is really a national level responsibility to ensure that the standardized health facility registers and patient forms account for or make, make provision for the collection of those data elements required to report those indicators. Um, there are data quality activities that are needed there. Um, and, and it becomes as a whole, um, um, a very um, integrated process that is weaved within um, the in, entire health informatics infrastructure at country level. There are of course, various challenges um, related to quality of care measurement. Um, and these are more related to, as I did mention, the novelty of the quality of care indicators that have been proposed. Um, there are issues around data quality and there are issues around understanding the quality of care data itself, because it has to be tied to improvement um, activities. And often enough, uh, there's lack of understanding as to how you understand your data in relation to various improvement activities in a specific area of work. It becomes even more complex when you have to um, look at uh, the impact of the quality improvement efforts across different ge geographical locations where quality improvement efforts have been initiated at different points in time and using different packages of, of improvement. Um, so if there's a facility in implementing a, a, an improvement idea um, for, to address uh, maternal mortality, for example, and another district has selected facilities in which there are improvement activities that are, support, uh, are supporting or are addressing a, a newborn area, a, a newborn related issue. Um, when you want to look at the Sentinel indicators across the two, two districts, and they've been implementing two different improvement uh, uh, ideas, it becomes quite tricky from a data analysis perspective. Um, so those are just a few of the challenges that I could mention. There's quite a lot that will appear in the report when you get an opportunity to read them. But um, I'll probably stop here and hand back to you, Blepta, just in case there's any follow-up questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Moise. And I think we may have a follow-up questions, but as time is running, I'd like to address two other questions that are a bit related and are in relation to uh, what is it inside quality of care or for maternal and newborn health. So one, it is in relation to mental health aspects in MNCH. And the second question is about uh, of the in, uh, emergency uh, care. But I'll start with the first one. And I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Ansha Banerjee to, uh, uh, to shed some light on the uh, involvement or so reflection from the panel on integration of mental health into quality of care for MNCH, uh, and that is beyond just responsive maternity uh, care. Anshu, over to you. Thanks, Plata. And uh, what comes to mind, first of all, I think, is uh, to look at uh, 
postnatal depression for mothers, um, because um, not only is it an issue for uh, the mother herself, but also for the newborn and for the child later in life, and also for family members. And I think it's very important that we look at this as part of the experience of care component of the standards for quality of care. Um, so that's one area I thought that this would, be, this would be relevant. The other one I think is really around bereavement because we are also looking at stillbirths. And uh, this is an area that also has long uh, mental health impacts on the parents. And I think that's an area that we need to really look in, into as well. And where again, the experience of, of a positive pregnancy, et cetera, comes into play. And finally, maybe a short point on uh, the health worker, um, her or himself. I think the COVID experience has really taught us that we also need to take care of the mental health of the healthcare worker. And that, you know, uh, we know, for example, in many low income countries, there's often only one healthcare worker in a remote health facility. Um, they are the ones that have to take care of everything. And, um, and so they, they require support uh, as well. And so this is an important issue, I think, from a systems perspective, even to look into how we can support healthcare workers and their needs in order to deliver care properly. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anshu. So Anshu, as you are connected, uh, I have a, a second question for you that is not in relation to mental health, but it looks at the uh, at the how we are looking at uh, addressing quality of care from a different angle. And the question is about how can we improve access to emergency care from the communities to health facilities? Uh, and that is through the lenses of reducing the second delay. So uh, how can we improve the access to emergency care by reducing the second delay? Any role of the paramedic training uh, in establishing or running an emergency referral network? And I'd like to ask the same question to Dr. Ted Babe from UNICEF so we can complete each other. So over to you, Anshu first, and then to Ted Babe. Thanks, Plata. And I think um, important there is, is how to engage the community. We have experiences uh, already from the last um, many couple of years, I would say, on how communities could have bicycle ambulances or motorized, uh, let's say, motor ambulances in order to facilitate transport uh, from the community to a health facility. And so this, this could be one way of involving uh, the community. And, uh, I, uh, and there we could, of course, also look at paramedical skills uh, in order to stabilize um, uh, patients, let's say, when they need to be referred. So there are quite some experiences there on facilitating uh, community engagement in um, providing transport for referrals. Um. Thank you, Anshu. So if I may add you know, on that, I would like you know, to point out um, maybe first changing you know, the, the long-held um, beliefs, attitudes in the community that maternal days, newborn days, stillbirth is an inevitable as you know, part of life. So you know, having that community engagement also changes uh, you know, dramatically that belief and just accepting it is as a fact. When communities are empowered in that way, they have a lot of resources, whether it is financial or leveraging, you know, existing resources. There are country examples where they have created a linkage with the private sector, the transport sector, and to allow, to increase, you know, access to transport. Uh, through the regular public, the private transport system. Uh, communities have also organized themselves, established uh, a revolving fund to be used for transporting mothers mostly, but lately even newborns also is increasing. Uh, so, you know, when we work with the community, there is a lot of uh, power, there is a lot of um, resources that, that is already existing, but we need to change the lens and mobilize and tap into that. Regarding the paramedic training, I think there are some examples, especially from low income countries, is coming up. Uh, I know in Ethiopia they have started, you know, training paramedics into uh, to, to to have, you know, this initially stabilization and making sure that the 
the, the immediate care is given while in transit to the center is a tough thing. Uh, but these are the areas I think, you know, uh, especially low income countries need to grow. Uh, yeah, so that's what I could say, Blair about you. And so maybe just one point to add, and that's, of course, uh, how communities can engage in providing maternal waiting homes. Uh, yes. That's an experience that we have had over the last couple of years. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you um, both. Um, I would like now to address another group of questions, which is in relation to community engagement. And I think it's a follow up question from the previous session and the presentation that I'm sure you did in which it looks that the, uh, as we move from leadership to action, the countries are, have made great progress in terms of leadership, establishing structures and systems, action, initiating all the learning districts and facilities and the quality improvement. But when it comes in terms of accountability and engaging communities, we see that there is, uh, the progress is not as fast as it was the uh, first two strategic objectives. So I'd like to ask this question first to Nuhu and then to all panelists who may want to uh, comment. Um, so Nuhu, uh, the question is the following. It is apparent from the presentations that progress in community level and first line health facilities is lagging compared to progress at the national level. What efforts are underway at those levels? So could you please share with us, based on all the country experiences, some examples of what is happening in relation to community engagement and improving accountability through our community lenses? No, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Blitzer. Um, so yeah, so that's, um, that's it. Thanks for that question. Um, what's happening in the network countries, and it is uh, correct that initially a lot of efforts were, were being made, particularly at the national level, to um, develop or strengthen structures around leadership and also to develop national strategies for quality of care and to also to with national planning around the maternal newborn health, child health, quality of care. What has happened now, particularly in the last two years of implementation, is a lot of effort now is now being moved down, um, to the sub-national level and also to the district level around strengthening the district health management team so that they can carry out and in, 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 in many ways take over the functions around implementation, around helping to develop systems to support, in particular support um, healthcare providers at, front, at, at point of care in health facilities. And so some of that work has, and Ma, 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 Matthew already highlighted that some of that work has been translated into the um, planning guide, which um, WHS has developed around planning for implementing MM program, quality of care programming. Some of that includes how do you help into strengthen capacity and support for health workers around QI skills, work around uh, making sure that at um, the district level and also in um, in health facilities, Moise talked about, just talked about that um, around strength in measurement systems and making the measurement, making sure that they're responsive to the needs of, at facility level, and also very much so creating that um, that network of learning where we are also seeing that in many countries, for example, in Ghana, Malawi, Ethiopia, lots of work and efforts have been put at supporting subnational learning where you have learning collaboratives, learning, learning networks at subnational level where facilities are coming together to share their experience, implementation experiences, what's working, what are the challenges and what they have done. Also in this, even in, including Bangladesh, where you're seeing from the national level support to develop implementation bundles, so simplifying the standards, simplifying um, implementation approaches so that it's clear that, for example, you want to implement um, KMC, Kangaroo Mother Care, what do you do? What are the resource needs? What's, what are the protocols to, um, in, to use? And that's just, all that is there in, in terms of helping to support um, implementation of national. In the community we're seeing in different countries, I think during the main presentation we had from Ghana about the community scorecard, we also seen that um, Ethiopia is also using the community scorecard in Malawi, they're using the hospital ombudsman system. And in Uganda, they're um, doing what they call village health dialogues. All of this is efforts to get communities participating around the, the dialogue and also planning. In Ghana and Ethiopia, the communities actually plan, carry out assessments or give feedback in terms of what's 
um, what they feel about the quality of care they've received in the health facilities in the districts. So all of this is um, ways that countries have, be have begun to think at, about approaches of one, in, in, increasing community participation, but also strengthening implementation at sub-national level. For the community also, um, WHO, use, based on some of those experiences, we have just um, last year launched, oh, sorry, this year, um, no, last year, launched um, a toolkit and guidance around how you can, how to bring in community and stakeholders into dialogues around quality of care for maternal and newborn child health. So a lot of work is happening. Um, some of it is just emerging. Some actually with very good lessons. And I think some of the um, the poll, the polling that we did on the Mentimeter, the main, main sessions about some of it, we have some of those lessons that have been synthesized around what should be shared in upcoming um, national forums, which we will be discussing. Um, over to you, Blaise. Thank you very much, Nuhu. Uh, I'll take advantage of having Dr. Uh, Dr. Muya Ojo of WHO Nigeria uh, connected, and he's one of the panelists. And first, I would like uh, Dr. Muya to uh, make a comment around community engagement in the framework of quality of care in Nigeria. Uh, uh, and then, uh, Dr. Muya, I have a, a second question for you as well. Could you please try to unmute yourself? Dr. Rojo, I Hello, see you are muted. You yeah, we hear you very well. So, Dr. Rojo, what is the uh, what is the situation okay. on community engagement around uh, quality of care in Nigeria? Any examples from your end? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I must add that uh, that's an area, but from the leadership, uh, the setup of uh, facility QI uh, communities in Nigeria, we have members of the community, what they call World Development Committee. Uh, they are part of the quality of care or quality improvement uh, teams in the facilities. The, what they do is they are able to synthesize the interest, the request, the feedback from the community and take it to the quality improvement team. So they have the monthly meetings with them after they've done their own meetings uh, in the communities and then they take it to the quality improvement teams and uh, you know, relay the priorities, the feedback uh, from community members or clients or patients who have used the services in the health facilities. Um, we, we've done some work around getting feedback from the communities and uh, we use that also to help to prioritize some of the quality improvement uh, aims in those facilities. Uh, so those, those are some of the areas uh, where we're engaging uh, with the community or the community engagement component of our work in Nigeria. And uh, Ojo, as you are online, uh, we have a question from the previous session that we couldn't address with Dr. Salma. Uh, but there is an interest from participants to understand if Nigeria has national guidelines on quality of care at the facility level. Uh, and uh, how, if yes, how is that uh, being implemented? Uh, so what we have is a sketch uh, with tools. So when we started, uh, we made deliberate plans to have very operational tools. So we have all the tools coming together in the guidelines that we're putting together. So in actual fact, we have those tools for prioritizations, for problem analysis, uh, for reporting, uh, the implementation package, they are well listed in the different tools, different job aids, uh, that we have. What we're now doing now is to put all that together in the standard guideline. We also have the, um, the training manual, which is also an operational tool for uh, the guideline. But uh, by and large, everybody who has gone through those trainings, uh, they have an idea of what uh, the country uh, is implementing, what are the implementation packages, what are the implementation approach? Uh, we have a customized tool 
uh, that are being used for by the coaches, by the facility QI, uh, program management tracking system by the you know, district or state level officials uh, to, to track implementation at state and at national level. So we have all that. What we are now doing now is to use the new um, WHO uh, 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 planning guide to become our implementation guide, which will be adapted, could be used uh, for the RMSCH quality of care program. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mumio. Um, I have, we have received at least three questions in relation to uh, improving quality of pre-service education and training. Um, I'm not sure that we have one specific panelist who is super specialized in this area, but I know that among our panelists, there, you will have opinions uh, in relation to uh, any strategies uh, that have, show, have shown results or any advice on how to improve quality of pre-service education and training as an input that defines quality of care. Uh, so would any of the panelists like to make a comment on this, uh, on this question? Lerta, if I could just make, make one very quick comment on this. I think some of the evidence around improving quality of care has shown us that importance of the sort of multimodal approach. So seeing training as something that, you know, an intervention that has to be integrated with other interventions as well for maximum impact. So I think that would be the first point that when we're thinking about training, we should also think about how it interacts with those other pieces that can be put in place to support the development of the workforce. Uh, second piece just to highlight is some work, not from, from WHO, but a great uh, piece on uh, some systematic reviews looking at healthcare provider performance uh, from Alex Rowe and colleagues uh, at CDC. Uh, I'll share the link, many of you will be very aware of this already, but that brings together lots of the evidence on what works to improve healthcare provider performance, including uh, strategies related to training. So I'll post that in the, the chat box. You're on mute, Berta, sorry. Sorry. No, uh, thank you. Uh, Anshu, would you like to make a commentary on the uh, workforce needs for the newborn care and the WHO's recent uh, push for uh, to establish and strengthen a newborn nursing cater? Thank you, Blata. And I think what's important is that we have realized now that 50% of under five mortalities among newborns, that we really need to look at how to uh, provide, strengthen the services. So one is an innovation that we're looking at is uh, really looking at how we can integrate maternal newborn care units uh, in the sense that in order to maintain skin to skin uh, contact um, and uh, kangaroo mother care, and that we do this um, from birth onwards, let's say. Uh, the other important area I think is also um, in order to have um, uh, special care units at lower level of the health system. So at district hospital level to have special care units in order to be able to take care of newborns. And this was, will of course um, require additional cadres uh, and additional manpower. So um, looking at some of these innovations that we think need to be scaled up in order to prevent uh, newborn mortality, uh, it will be important to bring an additional health workforce skills and, and uh, numbers uh, to be able to address that. Thank you very much, Anshu. And I'd like to add that uh, from WHO, we are uh, engaging with a number of countries and promoting, strengthening, and improving the quality of midwifery education. So for the past three years, a number of countries are implementing a midwifery education framework that is aiming at improving the quality of trainers, so educators, as an input that defines the quality that comes out of the end of the, of the education chain. And I see that Julia Bluestone from JPIGO, she has written in the chat that uh, JPIGO has 40 years plus experience in improving pre-service education. And they have found that the uh, education quality of health professions is improved a lot by accreditation. 
uh, as a quality assurance gold standard for uh, for having a competent workforce that is able to conduct uh, their, you know, their work. We are coming towards the end of our networking session. Uh, so before we wrap up, I'd like to uh, ask all panelists to take a minute and only to share one key message on what is it an element that all countries will need to address to improve quality of services for maternal and newborn health in a sustainable and scalable way. Uh, and I would like to start with uh, Ted Babe and I'll end with Ansho. So Ted Babe, from a UNICEF perspective, if you have to identify one priority action to improve quality of care for maternal and newborn health, that all countries have to follow. And that is based on the current experience that we're having together with these 10 network countries. What would be that priority? Uh, thank you, uh, Blata. Uh, it would be very difficult you know, to, uh, to identify just one. Uh, but uh, what I would say is you know, quality is key. That is what you have learned today, right? 50%. Could be of you know adverse outcomes could be prevented by just improving quality. So I would say you know governmental leadership ownership uh, to improve the financing and uh, organizing and delivering of service, uh, especially starting from the district level uh, to you know that district level engaging the community as well is crucial. Uh, when we look at uh, you know health investment, uh, it tends to heavily on tertiary facility and uh, i think this needs to change we have to reverse and you know strengthening the primary health care that primary health care should be the platform to deliver quality of care so i would say you know first and foremost you know the government leadership and ownership to really uh finance it and uh, organize the services in such a way that it is efficient and quality Thank you very much, Ted Baba. And I'd like to move now to Martin. Uh, Martin, if you have to highlight one, uh, although one action may be very little, but based on your in-depth experience with the Malawi team, what would be that one uh, recommendation or action that you have to share with us? Yeah, thank you very much, Plerta. <clears throat> and you know, what we've seen from, from the countries and, and maybe what I've also seen from in-depth experience in Malawi is the leadership at all levels, you know, from the national level um, down to the point of care, it's, it's crucial. And also now, you know, we continue to move the momentum on this. And you see, you know, the quality is key, but it's also complex and it takes time. And we've also seen, you know, based on the report that, you know, it, it takes a whole health system to move um, to increase the quality of care. But on the other hand, we see uh, evidence from, from countries now um, you know, that you know, the whole quality of care movement is, is now ongoing and we learn lessons on, and best practices, you know, on a daily basis almost from the countries. So just that, you know, keep the momentum, keep the leadership at all levels from national uh, down to the point of care uh, and continue to learn from, from the lessons in, in countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll shift now to Moise. Moise, what would be your one recommendation or highlight? Yeah, so one will be, I guess, uh, <laughs> biased towards measurement and this recognition in quality of care programming. Um, it goes without saying that um, this is often a challenge and one area that's overlooked despite its importance in ensuring that um, the right priorities are set and progress is tracked um, to inform any proactive or reactive decision-making in the process of quality of care implementation. So I would say that an early investment um, in a collaborative and in an intentional way in the data systems and building and strengthening the data systems for quality of care is quite critical because if it is left as it is, um, assuming that the way it is is not good enough, um, it's not going to happen. Uh, there's a need for ensuring that there is policy dialogue at macro level, there's capacity building, uh, there's the building of infra infrastructure uh, to support quality of care measurement um, so as to make it a meaningful process. Um, so that's probably what I would say. Thank you, 
around quality of care value. Back to you. Thank you very much, Moise. And now over to Matthew and Shams. Matthew. Thanks, uh, Blerta. I mean, I think the, the temptation is to, is to talk a bit about frameworks and policy, but actually I think there's an opportunity for us to start getting back to some basics. How do we um, ignite and um, develop compassion within health systems? And it's something that, that we've been looking at as well within uh, WHO, the critical role of compassion. Health workers, people working throughout uh, health systems are, are going into it generally for, for very good reasons and how we can uh, ignite that, that compassion and start to activate it across the health system uh, it, is a critical question for us. I don't think we have all the answers yet, but I think if we can start to put uh, compassion and people back at the centre of what we're doing, then that's just as important, of course, as uh, these policy frameworks. Thank you very much. Shams? Yeah, Blurt, so just a very uh, simple point. Learning from um, facility level learning to inform refinement of national strategic direction on quality. So really moving and flipping around the top down to the bottom up and thinking through how facility level learning can be utilized to make strategic directions in live time. Um, and, and, and with that comes an insistence on the culture of quality at all levels. Thanks, Blata. Thank you very much, Shams. Nuhu, your takeaway for today? Thank you. I'll, I think I'll be brief. I think, given I'm coming after so many people, I'll say, um, if how do we countries how do we translate everything that's been said to show that it's a, to make sure that to show that quality is a priority to translating that into where the investments are made in terms of both for broader national strategies for broader investment cases for health. So we, we need to see that um, that idea of quality as a priority being translated into those documents. Over. Thank you very much. And Anshu, over to you for a last word on the takeaway messages. I, I wanted to make one additional comment I highlighted earlier during the session, the issue of inefficiencies if we don't address quality of care. And I just wanted to add on that as part of UHC, equity is just as important. And I think that if we are not able to provide the same standard of care to everyone, we are really having an in inequitable world. And so I think that um, ensuring that standards of care are integrated into the interventions or that the quality of care is um, modeled on the standards standard of care, uh, irrespective of whether it's in a tertiary or a secondary or a, a hospital or a um, facility in a remote area, um, needs to make sure that every citizen, every woman, every child can have the same standard of care. Thank you very much, uh, Anshu. And I think with those a few words, I'll say I'd like to hand over to Olive for the uh, last part of the today's session. Uh, and before that, I'd like to thank everyone. Thank you for being with us on the previous session and in this session. Uh, we have some more news for you and would like to uh, see that this engagement continues. Olive, over to you. Thank you so much, Berta. Um, this last slide, this last moment is just to say, stay engaged. Um, we have logged all your questions today and we've created a community of practice. The link is here. Um, and we would like you to, to engage with looking at the questions, sharing your answers, your, your thoughts. We will continue that community of practice into our launch. Um, so today you saw a glimpse of the findings of the, the progress over the last four years of the network. We'll take a deeper dive on May 4th. Uh, we really look forward to you joining us. We've got a registration link, but we'll share this widely. And we'll continue that community of practice to continue this discussion and hear thoughts and, and learnings as they're, they're coming. Um, we're running a webinar series. Please see the link for the website there. We will continue our series in transforming care for small and sick newborns. Um, we have series running on lessons from countries, um, a private sector series, and we're starting a community engagement series to share the lessons from countries. Um, that's the primary focus of all of these webinars and share the experience and the learning thus far. Um, so thank you. Um, you know, that's all there really is, unless there's any question or comment. Um, I think we can leave it there and just say thank you so much for your engagement with us. We look forward to continuing more.
Thank you very much. And uh, good luck to Line m and We are very happy to be associated with a series of conferences and we're looking forward to continue to learn together and to uh, learn and to implement together as we move into the next uh, lessons, but also the next series of meetings. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon or a good uh, morning for some.